Welcome back. Before we jump into game two of Echo Fox versus Immortals, I want to introduce the NALCS1 viewers to our newest caster, Clayton, Captain Flowers Reigns, who just finished up his first uh, cast rather over on NALCS2, FlyQuest versus Envy, a Swift 2 But how did it feel getting out there and doing it? Man, it was electric. Yeah? Actually casting on the big stage with a cheering crowd right beside you. You're on the desk. You're with the guys that you're normally just watching on Twitch, right? Yeah. Like casting next to Kobe, it was a phenomenal experience. Yeah, and that guy's got a lot of energy, too, to match yours. So it was a very exciting cast, to say the least. But, you know, most... Uh, if not all of our viewers, will, are, will have some idea of who you are because you're slightly Reddit famous for a few plays Maybe a little bit. Uh, earlier in your amateur career as a caster. Uh, but I want to know where the journey started. You know, where did you even, what was the impetus for wanting to become a caster? Well, you know, I've been playing League of Legends since 2009, like back when the game came out. I've got the, I don't have the Bowser Ramus skin, but I've mm. got the, I've got the UFO Corky, so okay. I can at least take that claim to fame. But I've been playing the game for a long time. I've always enjoyed playing the game. And it was something where when I was trying to kind of figure out where I wanted to go in life, having graduated college, but not really settled into a career path. Right. Some friends and family were like, hey, you like League of Legends? You like this whole like competitive gaming thing? See what you can do with it. And as a Skarner one trick, you can't go pro. That doesn't happen. That doesn't work. No, not so much. Especially so, not in the 10-band system. No, not in the 10-band system. You can't play the game. Right. So I was pretty much like, hey, let's give this a shot. And I started in summer 2015. I was doing solo casts of my friends playing solo queue. Uh-huh. And I evolved through amateur leagues and worked my way up what to you the you say, point. friends, family, and of course then uh, you had support from the internet itself. But... Friends and family, I mean, a lot of people still are looking at this industry that's growing and evolving, and some people still have res reservations about, you know, the legitimacy of career paths oh, yeah. in esports. Oh, yeah. But you had support from your family, so talk to me about that and, you know, kind of the upbringing that allowed you to take a risk to some degree in, in moving into this unknown space that's ever growing and changing. You know, I'm actually incredibly, incredibly fortunate to have the people surrounding me that I do have surrounding me. My dad especially was someone who, despite the fact that he doesn't know really anything about League of Legends, right? right. Like he's <laughs> tried to watch the streams like, I don't know what's going on with this, but I'm still tuning in. Yeah. He encouraged me, like he was somebody, he went through all the work, he built himself up to be a successful person. He was like, if you can find something that you love to do, just do it, just mm -hmm. shoot for it. And so that's, that's what I did. When I got first started with this, even just starting off with casting, I was like, you know, League of Legends, that's the game I wanna cast, but you know, this is the biggest game in the world, this is the game that's got the most viewers, the most everything, and I was like, do I even have a shot at this? <laughs> and if you asked me a year and a half ago, I would have said, hell no. Right. But I figured, you know, if you're gonna go big, Go as big as you can, yep. and here I am talking to you on the desk. Well, and like you said, you put the work in, and and this is where I want to now go to back to that kind of Reddit fame, you know, for a bit, mm -hmm. which is that you know it was a lot of time, effort, and work that you put into all of these amateur casts until you finally got recognized. What was it like in that moment when the Reddit community, the, the larger league community, and the esports community got behind you and said, "We like this guy. We want to see him on the LCS broadcast." That was just the coolest because what happened you know for a long time i was casting these like very small tournaments very contained pretty mm -hmm. much right the, I, the first thing i ever cast and i tell this to all the people who ask me about it the first thing i ever cast was a random thing i found on the forums 20 minutes before it started for eight viewers five of which were the guys putting it on nice so i came from a situation where i wasn't used to having a lot of viewers used to having a lot of eyes and one of the amateur leagues that i cast for there was a clip where I was casting a Baron fight. It went viral overnight, and I had all these people on Reddit saying, hey, we really like this. We really like what, what you're doing. Right. And it just turned into this really cool experience that was that much more motivation to just keep going and get to the point that I'm at now. All right, final question, and I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but do you have a most memorable moment from your very first NALCS cast from today? From my very first NALCS cast? Well, the one that people have not let me forget about as it was happening, there was a team fight in the upper part of the river. Yeah. And it was just going absolutely crazy. Like, Apollo was getting off so much damage. Fight after, And I'm doing the motion right now because it's the motion I did. <laughs> but he's just, he's putting arrow after arrow into these guys. And I, I did that motion I was casting, and I didn't even realize it. Yeah. And as it finished, I was looking at Kobe laughing, and I was like, God, I hope they don't put that on the thing where they show the cast. And then sure enough, as soon as I'm walking back after the cast yeah, is done. Yeah, you can't trust these people no, who run the show. No, absolutely not. Yeah. But there was, I had four or five different people say, hey, you see this? Yeah, And that's so awesome. it was, it was great. Hey, you're feeling it in your body. You're getting excited. That's half the battle there when casting League of Legends. Well, ladies and gentlemen, one more time, Clayton Reigns. We're more than happy to have him joining the NALCS team. It is now time to rejoin the casters, though, to take us into game two of Echo Fox versus Immortals. Take it away, gentlemen. 
Thank you very much, Dash, and great to hear from Clayton. But before we get into game two, we do want to talk about our player of the game, of course, since Irene, it was a pretty easy one here. Acadian just had such a magnificent performance. Oh, yeah. Acadian carried that game from start to finish there. It did seem like there were some shot calling issues that will get shored up over time, but he's a rookie, and I want to see what else he has because being on Graves, having everybody else kind of pitch in with the CC, now that was definitely a performance that is going to be on his record forever. Like, that is a game that if you want to show people what Acadian's all about, you kind of show him that early game. Don't leave us. Yeah. But still. <laughs> I mean, even in the latter stages of that game, uh, his ultimates were excellent. I feel like he was still outputting quite a lot of damage in those team fights. Very impressive overall. But what changes, I guess, moving into our second game here? I think Echovox had a pretty prepared strategy. I like the twist of fate from Froggen for a number of reasons, but that's probably not making it through one of the five bands Immortals have. Yeah, and I think that Immortals, you know, they're going to look at that and be like, okay, they couldn't really end the game. Like, is that an Echo Fox problem? Is that a comp problem? Because you look at that comp and you think, that one could probably end the game with diving turrets and stuff like that. So if Immortals might want to match them on the team fighting aspect and try to win team fights, because that seems to be Echo Fox's weakness, you target the weakness of the team, you draft around that, instead of drafting something that has no tank. I think that's probably pretty smart. I mean, Malkai is such an easy plug and play tank to get into your team comp that's relatively easy to pick up in a draft. But we'll see what happens here, because I think draft was curious by both sides and Immortals maybe pick themselves into a bit of a corner. Well, at the end of that game. Well, we'll see what happens, of course. Cyrus Syndra banned out from Immortals in Phase 1. Kimiel and Rengar from Echo Fox. So we're seeing a lot of just general strong champions banned once again. Red side goes for the kind of typical bands and more targeted bands here from Immortals. Actually, as they once again ban Syrah and ah. two mid laners away from Frogging. Yep. And so last time, the only ban that changed was actually Rise wasn't banned. Yep. And Cassiopeia wasn't said. So when you see the Cassiopeia ban, you expect the Rise to come through because Cassio is the typical counter. Yep. LeBlanc, of course, the last man from Echo Fox and Rise, the easy first pick there from Immortals. So kind of all going according to plan right now as far as the draft goes. I love the Markai lock in there from Lupa. And we're going to go for Gate Malzahar once again. Solid champions. Can flex the Malzahar if you wanted to, but these do their jobs and they do them very well. That's why they're such popular champions. Yep. And you might expect the Misfortune to come back through for Immortals early on. Uh, to try and counter the Malzahar. It was okay in lane, but the question is, is it effective enough in the late game, or do they want more CC from that bottom lane? Is there a possibility that they go for something else here instead to try and get some pressure? I wonder if they'll go Varus Misfortune here, perhaps. I kind of like the Varus here from Cody's son. You mentioned CC. I mean, his Ash looked okay, but arrows weren't quite hitting like we've seen some other top caliber Ash players. This brings a little bit of CC from your bottom lane, while probably giving Ole that aggressive support that he did perform very well on. Yeah, if you do want to tank, you go for something like Nautilus, or you go for the Rex in the jungle if you want to play a carry top. I talked about it last time, where if you see if you're a top, typically the team wants to have the Cinder Hulk Rek'Sai in the jungle, because you think about the junglers on the tier list, it's really the only one that's in that S tier that'll build the Cinder Hulk and build tanky. Every, everybody else kind of goes for warrior like Kha'Zix, then you have the Graves, then you also have the Rengar on top of that, so you go down that tier list and Rek'Sai is really the big tanky one. Left. Good champion to take away from Arcadian. It was banned actually in the last game, so I like this pickup in general from Immortals. Froggen, once again, Gonna uh, pick the Anivia. He ah. likely knows his matchup. It's 90 plus percent Pobelter's rise here in this particular game. Flame, of course, could play the mage if he wanted to. But Misfortune's gonna get banned by Echo Fox as we have moved into phase two of the bands now as well. And that's kind of the, the obvious one here. Ollie didn't take it, so Echo Fox easily take it away from him. Yeah, it's difficult for the rise to get in onto the Anivia, so I like that pick here from Echo Fox, especially since Anivia was banned in the second phase by Immortals last time. So now they have a pretty okay matchup in the mid lane. Comfort for Froggen as well, and it stops sieges. So Immortals closing games out becomes very difficult against the likes of an Anivia. Well, what's the second ban here for Echo Fox? The final ban of the whole draft. It will be Lulu, actually. So targeting kind of counters or strong picks versus that support Malzahar. Obviously, giving it away with the first few picks that they support Malz, unless Looper's really doing something wonky with Gay. But uh, I like this, you know, pinch a roll that you've already taken. You've taken one of the best champions for it. Take away all the counters, and Ole's going to have to fall very far down and probably not be able to answer the Malzahar one. Malzahar is left unchecked. Very powerful. Yeah. Most likely the Karma would be the next pick up there. I think, assume the Jin, yeah, as the next ban there. So Caitlyn might get picked up by Keith. Uh, Lucian's still on the table, and so is Kalista. And those are kind of those three champions, as well as Ezreal, that, is, that are in that pool that you would want to play in the AD carry role right now. Unless you're Piglet, and then you just go for Twitch. So I think it's interesting because the bottom line didn't get much attention, but was a real back and forth, it felt like. So to see both teams uh, target bottom lane with their second phase of bans, but in a very different way, it's kind of curious. Support's banned for Echo Fox, AD carries banned for Immortals. Ezreal is the champion Keith has to fall to. Very safe champion, is almost always good. 
uh, may not be great in a lot of stages, but if you're a strong Ezreal player in particular, you're almost always going to make it work. Yeah, very large effective range or long effective range, but no CC really unless he gets an Iceborne Gauntlet. And then that cuts into his damage of the Trinity Force build that he would really like to have. And that's what I also thought it would be for Ole. He is a legacy Morgana player. First time I actually ever saw Ole play, he was the first person that I had seen not put points into W on Morgana. He was all points in Q and Black Shield. He didn't want to shove the wave, didn't want to do anything like that, or take away from the fact that he would have a longer binding time. So it was just Q and E back and forth. And it was actually really interesting. So good to see him on this champion. That's comfort for him. Well, love that there. And a comfort again for Flame, who almost managed to tip the scales back in favor of, um, of other mortals there in the first one. Kazakhs will be the lock-in for Arcadian. So I kind of like this, taking uh, Dardox champion from game one away from him. We'll see how he performs on a significantly stronger jungler, at least as far as perception or tier lists go. But Flame, like you said, paired with the Rek'Sai side this time, feels like a very uh, strong thing. Dardox likely going to be there in the top lane, helping Flame out. We've seen Flame when he gets going. He is more than happy to try and carry a game. And he got very close in game one. Exactly. That's the thing, though. He's got to get going. So the Rek'Sai might make some early ganks up top, whereas last time was a little bit more focused on the bottom there from Dardog. And the picks and bans definitely focused the bottom lane here. Was trying to get Immortals a little bit of a better matchup if they could, and try to push Keith off of Utility and onto something where he has to do a little bit more damage and put himself out there. Yeah, Katie and Froggen again are going to have to be the real big forces in this game. Looper can still perform and help shore up Echo Fox's team fighting with the Maokai. He did have a lot of good moments in that game as well, particularly when Echo Fox did get around to fighting. Be kind of curious to see how the comp works out. It feels like a very similar makeup as far as the compositions go here. So once again, after a very long game one where you could point out mistakes on either side, a mortal drop may have shoehorned them a little bit last time, but I think in this game, given that they pick similarly, it's going to be as always execution. Yep. And Execution is what it comes down to here. And there's a lot of pick potential on both teams, actually. You could get caught out by the Anivia, the Malzahar, anything like the Maokai, too. But then Immortals have a lot of their own as well. That bottom lane, when you have a Varus and a Morgana, Binding Lands, you're eating a big arrow. Or if the, vice versa, right? You're going to eat a big arrow, or you're going to eat the uh, Chain of Corruption, Morgana's going to come through next. Yep. So I like it all here. We'll see what happens, though, in game number two. Immortals and Echo Fox back onto Summoner's Rift for our second game of the series. Echo Fox looking for their first series win. They got their first game win in the first one. And Immortals, of course, a fresh season with a bunch of new players on the roster. Pobelta, the only remaining player from last year. We'll see if they can tie things up and try and get a first series win. Immortals were almost unassailable last year. Dropping a series here would be a very different feeling for what I suppose is a very different team as well. Yeah, very different team, but still has that name and still has Poe Belter as well. Oh, actually spotted somebody in that bush, spotted Keith. So we'll be able to check items and know that that's who he saw. Hat was sticking out. Yep. Unlucky. <laughs> but also, I want to talk about this as well, because Immortals last time actually didn't really have any CC in their composition. It was Ash, Arrow was really the CC that they had. They had Misfortune, Fiora, Kha'Zix, and Corky. So the only hard stun on that team would be a Riposte or the Ash Arrow. So now they have a lot of low cooldown CC that they could use to catch people or pick people, which did seem to be a problem for Immortals previously, where they had to wait constantly, like you were talking about, on Cody Sun's Arrow. Every time. Arrow, arrow, arrow. Now they can make plays with more frequency. And it seems nice that even if they fall behind, they have good tools to find picks and get themselves back in the game. And if they get ahead, then they can just start steamrolling through and go pick after pick after pick. So we'll see how the early game goes. Echo Fox have looked almost spotless in the early game as Looper. Ooh, he's going to face check a couple. Flame and Dardock there. Good cue from Looper gets them out of the way. But uh, that looks like a buff steal coming through. And immediately, Cody Sun and Ollie going to check this. Yep, going to chunk him out. Arcadian. Yeah, they, they have to run back. They can't actually continue to poke him down there because then they get cut off and collapsed on. And now he has to walk the long way around. You can't walk into a Malzahar that has the W rank one because then he just gets two Voidlings and he just chunks you out. Yeah, and Gate's gonna, Gate knows this. He's going <laughs> to chase him all the way over. <laughs> go around. Go all the way around. <laughs> no cheating. Go all the way around. He's actually still going. But Acadian's coming in as well. Exactly. Assisting Acadian to get in here onto the red buff because the red buff was stolen by Dardock, and they know that because they had seen him with Looper previously on the top side. He's actually still going, but he's going to help with the buff instead, which I like. Dardock back to his blue buff, of course. So just some vertical jungle here, unless Ole has a miracle pull steal in mind. Yeah, there's no smite here, so... All right, he got, got it. <laughs> Isolation damage is enough as Looper. A lot of damage at level one. Flame really abusing those vitals with the lunge. Well, when you know where the enemy jungle is, you can go in as a top laner. He's on bottom side of the map. Absolutely no threat to me in the top side. So Looper 
has to play more defensive, and Flame gets to play further up, especially since Rek'Sai, they know, are, is on this side of the map because he wasn't at that red buff. No, Acadian okay, level two is actually going to go back towards his Grom, so the jungle was not disrupted by Dardoch's early start, but maybe some initiative gained there by Immortals, and safety for Flame is even better. So Dardoch already influencing that top lane. We'll see if he directly goes there and trying to get a Gengar, or if he's happy to leave Flame in the 1v1. And we know Flame is pretty happy in a 1v1. Yeah. Very happy. If you can leave him on an island there, he'll just start to develop a lead. And it's insane to think about how he came back and was just pushed off onto a side lane. And then the team played around the fact that he was there the whole time, that they didn't get caught out, that they didn't give up too many kills afterwards. So Immortals did have a good defensive style that they were able to play for a long period of time. But Echo Fox, they need to up their aggressive style. They need to find ways to close the game. Well, very curious to see if Arcadian can make it 4 for 4 in First Bloods. He's going to mosey on it into Echo Immortals Jungle, excuse me. Does find Dardoch, but he's a level down. Gates here as well for some assistance. Wants to steal the plants. Gate really trying not to auto it. <laughs> but I think maybe he now will, they'll though. go for it. And yeah, they can take the yeah. ward down now as well. So good save there from Gate on the plant. Yes. And a lot of action early actually from Echo Fox's support player. Things I've been noticing when supports invade is they'll try to hit every plant that they can in the enemy jungle. Uh, oh, Morgana, binding. That's a face. Binding straight in there. In fact, Keith is going to go in. Oh, hey, pretty squishy. In fact, Keith straight in. Gets himself exhausted, but there's the exhaust following in. Heal used as well as Dardoch. We're going to try and make something happen, but I believe he got spotted. He did. Smart disengage there from Echo Fox. Yeah, so much damage from the Malzahar support with the Voidlings coming out, and they just multiply in those first few seconds and just make even more. And if he has two ammo charges, he just gets four, and they just start ripping people apart. And uh, when I talked previously about uh, Ole's Morgana and not putting any points in W, he definitely points, puts points into W in this matchup because of the fact that he wants to just get the... the oh. That was a really wow. cool blast going to use. Luba's going to try and gank Flame. Arcadian's here. Flame, I think he knows that something's up. He's got a gas. Can he get himself out of the way? Arcadian, can he make a fall before he lands? Oh. He does it again. He got him as he flashed too. He predicted the flash. He put himself in the leap to get ahead. And he's like, no matter what Flame does, I kill him here. If he flashes, I'm queuing backwards. If he's in front of me, it's forwards. It's a buffer there on the Q spell. Hold on, though. Teleport from Looper, dive in from Dardoch. Keith, we're going to go down, but he's not dead just yet. Dardoch Q? still chasing his Pobelt. Let's see Flash in as a Pobelt. We'll get it with a Rune Prison. But Dardoch now getting chased out of the way. It was actually Froggen that came down as well with Looper. But no kill trader back there. Nice dive from Dardoch. Very nice orchestrated dive there. Flame also gets to go to the top side of the map with his teleport. Recover a little bit here too. Has the cull. Will start to farm up again. Even though he got ganked. Now, oh, lands on gate. That's bad news for gate, but the spell shield's on gate. He's gonna go down. No, Froggen! This takes out Dardoch and Steg with a combo. And Gate's gonna flash his way out to safety. Arcadia now covering for the rest of his team. He's just everywhere. Oh, Froggen wants it. He wants a lay. Stuns him up. Damage is there. Acadian again. 2-0. Again, Acadian off to a great start here. And Froggen is well on top of it. Just absolutely beautiful play on the Anivia. Kept track of the flash. Threw out the Q because he was up against a wall. He had no other options on where to run. And also the one previously, he let it pass through and did the Q afterwards. So the spell shield broke. He still got the stun on it on Dardoch. And again... They're very familiar with these champions, particularly Froggen with his. Just watch this again. I like that Mortals are playing aggressive, but Echo Fox are answering very well. Right here. Boom, boom. And it still stuns Dardoch. So, really well played there. And Acadian comes through. And now Ole puts himself up against a wall. And he can't walk backwards because Acadian dodges the binding. And yep, there's really no option there for Ole to get away. He moves up. There's a minion there blocking him. If he goes down, it's not enough. So yeah, Echo Fox out to another early lead here. And Acadian, I believe, that was another first was. blood. He's four, four for four, four now. For four. Two of those games for losses. So yeah. this man just has something going on when it comes to killing people for the first time. Cloud Drake also over to Echo Fox. Bit of help from Malzahar there. It's really easy to take objectives. So smart play again after capitalizing on Immortals over aggression. And again, I do like that Immortals are trying to be more proactive, but Dardoch overextended himself there, and Echo Fox punished very well. Yeah. Flame, he did get a little bit off of that, though, because he got the teleport out of Looper to the bottom side. He got the TP to the top, so it was punished on the bot side, and Dardoch did a good job of diving in. But ultimately, what it comes down to is the goal isn't actually that different because the fact that Flame got to CS. Oh, he stole Ooh. it. <laughs> Acadian is like, I, I see you, I see you. Acadian's actually smiling more about that than Dardoch was. Dardoch. Definitely the pretty serious look on his face right now as Froggen going to take his own blue buff. Very swift. Pick up there for Anivia. Can I move yourself back to the mid lane? 
Yeah, but two mana scaling items on these champions in mid. Not too surprising, but the early tier and the catalyst being done is good news. Gating some damage there. And this is like so cool. I just wanted to talk about like the 10 bands again, because I, I did it previously with, with uh, what we were seeing from Akkadian with Graves. It's like Froggen's just going to play Anivia, right? It's like not a problem at all. Akkadian, though, speaking of... Uh-oh! Uh-oh! <laughs> Dotto gets a knock -up. Now leap away, but here comes the ulti up from Pobelta. He's invisible, but not long enough. Stun's going to cover, just gets Pobelta. And Dotto zoned away by Glacial Storm. Ooh. Sometimes you just got to hit the blast code. You just got to do it and hold oh, on game. Oh, okay. That's a knock -up. That's going to be death. Pobelta, his second kill of the game. And now that Rise is banned out so frequently. Off to a good start here up against the Anivia. And the Anivia, it's hard to close the distance on her. She'll slow you. She'll stun you. He has enough. He ha <laughs> you can't wait that out. He's got blue buff, right? It'll, it'll take a long time. All right, there you go. He knows Froggen's love for minion yeah. waves. It's like Froggen is just zoning him off, making sure he can't pick it off or pick it up. But I like it, but Froggen doing very nicely in the lane so far. Flame dashing back in onto Looper. So has proc that vital and do a decent chunk of damage, but Looper's actually not too poorly off at this stage. It actually looks like Froggen's kind of going off to the side here, clearing out, I believe, a control ward in the bush. So he's feigning towards top. Great bait from Looper, actually. Kind of looks like the jungler's there, but we can see, of course, that Arcadian's not, but it gets a good trade down flame. Maybe hesitant to commit, or Looper just knowing some trade patterns well. Dardock actually towards the top side of the map. He's going to use that ultimate to get to the ground, but we'll see if he wants to make something happen even more. And Frog and Hug in the left side of this lane a lot in his roam maybe indicates he's also trying to help Looper out in a particularly tricky 1v1. Somebody who's going to get help out. Nice block the there. <laughs> Good hands. The Voidling actually spawns instantly, even before it shows the animation. He takes damage, but he's trying to bait for Arcadian, who's actually coming bottom lane. I think this is the first time we've seen a jungler in the series come towards this side of the map early on. Katie to binding, no arrows in. That's going to be good damage, but exhausted it down. Here's the Katie with a surprise. Oi! Taking damage from the Ezreal True Shot Mirage, but it's not enough for another kill. Yeah, the fact that Froggen has priority on the mid lane, you can see he was just playing off to the right side there. Once again, Akkadian down to the bottom lane to try and get them some turret pressure. They've actually been losing this lane here. Both of them have ended up dying. One of them got picked off earlier. Dardot coming through for Akkadian. Now they know he's here. Push him off. Akkadian leaps out. He's safe, but Control World's going to keep that tribush clean for Immortals bottom lane. Akkadian instead going to go over to the Scuttle Crab. I expect to see some fighting up top quite soon because of that, because they saw both junglers on the bottom side. But no, it's just going to be wave clear here. All right. Yep. It's just the Maokai. Once you know, again. Do, do your thing with yep. Cole. Once again, Fiora is just going to have to scale up. Early Cole, once again, like you mentioned, for Flame, is he's happy to farm it out and kind of wait till the 2-3 item mark, like we saw in game number one. As far as strength goes, it kind of just is the jungles at this point. Cinderhold for Dardoch and uh, the early warrior, with both of them having red smite here, does mean that they can influence a lot. And you can see them coming to lanes quite often, trying to influence them. Going bot, which is a bit of a different look than we saw in the first game. Other than that, in the mid laners, and Froggen does have TP. They're going to be the ones to really influence this. Good oh, poke from Akkadian. Got the ghost. Gets the summoner. This is just pressure on the bottom side. Ole kind of zoning Akkadian off. Good coverage, and that tower's going to go down, actually. Once again, Immortals abuse that back timing. Yep, abuse the back timing because they sent Ezreal and the Malzahar back, even though they were the ones that were pushing. So that's first turret going down in favor of Immortals, so they get that extra gold. And we want to talk about Akkadian's first blood rates. He's 100% so far. Two for two bottom turrets in the series for Immortals is also nice, and that's the first turrets as well. So a bit of extra gold is always looking good. And you mentioned it already, Cody's son, actually pretty significantly winning in CS here. 20 up with that turret gold. Going to give him a nice leg up. I think we kind of expect Ezreal to not fare too well in lane, but he tends to balance lands out and at least go even. And this isn't quite even, unfortunately. Yeah. And the fact that Echo Fox now have a bit of a disadvantage, 2,000 gold down, uh, mostly because of the CS difference and the fact that oh, there is a call, to even a little bit more gold, just a little bit, and the fact that they got first turret. Oh no, Ole baited him in. Here comes the KD, the one thirty son. There's the kill. Look for the reset. Ole gets chunked out. My goodness. And the bottom lane gets destroyed. Poe Belter and Dardock looking for Keith here. Trying to run. Poe Belter has ulted his way in, and Keith doesn't have too many places to go. Flash Rune Prison is going to give Poe Belter yet another kill. Hit his jungle averse mid here for Fox Versa Models. Oh, that's risky. And he goes. He goes right in there. Does the smart thing, goes straight through the tunnel, but might lose the turret. This is massive for Ego Fox if they can take this down, because all of a sudden, those good early games. Oh, lockdown as well for Gate. Dardock can get stunned up again. That's just reckless, and Gate takes him down. Gate hitting level six. 
pops the ultimate there. Dardock seems like he was a little bit too uh, eager to just get in there. And it, yeah, Gate had been six for quite a while as well. So it wasn't just something that just popped up. That's not the first time we've seen it, but we'll kind of watch this again. This is such great synergy from the mid and jungle. Taking such big risks here. And yeah, mid jungle synergy is so important. And this large advantage comes through that here for Echo Fox in that mid lane. And then Keith oh. goes on an adventure. I think Dardock might have actually failed getting over the wall with a tunnel. Or maybe, oh, maybe he went over and then he flashed back. Because that flash and the tunnel was on cooldown. What happened? Something happened. Seen in the front. There's some kills credit there is nice. Nice parry there from Flame. They continue dealing a bit of damage to Looper. But Looper's pretty tanky even in the early stages with Flame not having the items up just yet. And I really do want to have a look at Dardock here because we've seen multiple times already he's gone in quite aggressively and it's cost him his life, I think, on almost all of the occasions. Dardock is a hot-headed player, that's for sure. Someone that does not take losses lightly. He loves to win. He's got this great competitive fire. It's why he's such a strong-looking player, but you have to worry that Dardock's still got some maturing to do, and those sort of reckless plays, if he keeps doing them, it's obviously bad for his team in the game, but that's something he'll have to learn over the course of the season. Yeah, it's one of those ganks where afterwards, like, how did they still have this up? But hold on, here's a gank in the top lane. Dardock looking for a tower dive, flame, trying to get ahead here. Lupa does have the flash, can he outplay here? Dardock actually tanking turrets. What? That was, okay, Flame actually backed off first, even though he wasn't the one tanking turret. That was really awkward, but Poe Belter, he has the ultimate, but, uh-oh. Right into there. Oh, oh no, feels bad. Gets exhausted. Okay, he's gonna chase him. That could be another kill. Voidlings in for a flash auto. And there's the shutdown, but three members top teleport in for Froggen to defend his top laner. Finding land, flame in on top of it, but Looper still there. Oh, a fast flash is enough flame. He still wants at the wall. Barely not enough for flame. Likely gonna go down. Froggen, the minion, the, the counter kill. Counter minion secures it. Froggen's favorite. Oh, the counter minion picks up the kill there on the flame. Played pretty well there across the map from both teams, but Echo Fox, they do come out on top. They have the momentum as well, but Froggen, they know. It's like a five-year career killing cannon minions. How does he curry favor and get the other one to shoot him? <laughs> <laughs> Paid that one off, but hold on. Yeah, got him finding Dardock, taking Whoa. damage, looking for the 1v3. Uh, Got's exhausted, does have an egg flash. Oh no, it's enough, Cody. So I'm gonna flush out from the storm. And now Immortal's gonna try and take him down. Oh, but made, there's the shutdown. That was almost a huge outplay from Froggen. He put the wall right on where Dardock was coming out. Hold on though, can't talk about that, cause here comes Flame. Flame. Gate, looking a little vulnerable. Keith's like, see you buddy, I'm out of here. Gate's actually, no, see you buddy, I'm out of here. And Keith's like, how do I get out? Flash over is good with the E. Pobelta locks him up on the other side. Keith stands his ground, Pobelta kills him. Meanwhile, Acadian sneaks the Drake. Don't let them check, Drake, don't let them check. Don't let them check, don't let them check. Okay, Pobelta has the trinket work, doesn't throw it over the back, and Arcadian gets his team the second Drake of the game. First one was early, so second Ocean is nice, and we did see a lot of Drakes being taken by Echo Fox before, maybe looking to snowball them again. Yeah, and I mean, speaking of snowballing, Arcadian mid 4-0 and 2, and like, Pope Elter sees he's got, he's got Ward right there. He's went right into them. Looks like it wasn't the best use of his ultimate, of course. Really good job here, Flame. Almost kills Looper, but then Looper with the counter, but hold on. Back to live. Nothing happening. Yeah. You have to hold your breath because you know. Like, it's like, usually, if the what, what, what does the camera know that we don't? Yeah. Because they always know something I don't. Oh, it oh. knew it. It knew it. Oh, okay, never mind. It didn't. <laughs> Not this time, at least. But I mean, a really high intensity game. We're 16 and a half minutes in or so with uh, 14 kills happening. We saw a pretty bloodthirsty game. I believe in Echo Fox's first game yesterday versus P1. And I like that both teams are turning up the intensity, but Echo Fox again with a stellar looking early game. Yeah, the early game has been really solid. And even despite the fact that Immortals were farming a little bit better in their lanes, uh, had a winning bottom lane, had a winning top lane, gets turned around by Acadian once again. Lose out on first turret gold as well, but Echo Fox are now up in structures and are doing quite well. Sure, it's not 6,000 gold lead or anything like that, but right now... That's a dead Cody Sun! Another pick! And Acadian gets credit for that kill once more. Five kills now. <laughs> Make me look good, guys. Let me get all the yeah, kills. Yeah, pump the KDA up. But like he, a player of the game. <laughs> exactly, right? He is uh, a carry jungler right now. And he has been doing wonders for this squad because normally 
can be like, all right, another Echo Fox game where they do nothing for the first part, but now they're very, very active. And this is really cool to see and watch it develop over time. I love the double TP play. Echo Fox are making very crisp rotations together, starting to force a lot of skirmishes. And Gates pretty much been stuck with Arcadian this whole time. 2v2 again. No, it's going to be 3v2. Who is always in the backside? Arcadian trying to get away, but he saved himself. The Hex Drinker popping does help him out. There's a teleport onto a Voidling, which is adorable, and Froggen trying to wall somebody off. It's Dardock, then he's caught in the trap. Looper follows in after the flash, and Froggen looks to get the stun back in. Not chilled there on the E, so that's not quite there. Must not have had the cooldown, because that was going to be a kill. Yep, and now they just get to push up that top lane. That might be another turret going over to Echo Fox, so they'll have all of the Tier 1 turrets down here. And it's kind of like what happened last game. They get all of those outer structures down. Phase 2 is very difficult for them. They do have pick potential. They do have Froggen on the Anivia for comfort. How are they going to do it? And I think that's the difference that you highlighted, that instead of just using their superior map rotations, they had a Twisted Fate before they used their teleports well early from Lufa and taking structures kind of that way. I like that they're actually looking for kills first and then taking the objective. It's kind of a like an older style of League of Legends in a lot of ways, but sometimes just brute forcing them. I mean, the easiest way to take an objective when you have no one to contest it for you. Getting picks off does help there, and I like that Echo Fox are sticking together and using their pick tools effectively. Exactly, and now the fact that they have so much damage and ability to pick people off, they can play to that. But they didn't get that last structure up top yet. Keith will shove this wave out one more time. He actually doesn't have any support here, so he's going to have to kind of play a little bit safe. Not exactly sure which side of the map Dardock is on. There's nothing in that southern part of the jungle for Echo Fox to see. Everyone's still kind of scaling up as well. We're almost 20 minutes into the game. Drake not spawning just yet. Time is a pretty desynchronized that you might expect from a normal game. So the seven minute cloud that Echo Fox took. Rodavid is stacking up for both mid laners though. Looks like Froggen's going for Morello Nomicon for another additional bit of mana from the lost chapter and will likely build into that very efficient item. But we've got the Archangels done now for Pobelto building in towards the Seraph Transform. And Flame is approaching those two items with the AD carries kind of still collecting pieces and looking for their first major ones. So the mid game team fight's going to look pretty close. Froggen actually just finished his item, but he's quite strong right now. Teleports back to try and force something here. But Immortals are playing pretty smartly and a little far back, giving the respect right now, even though the gold is quite close. Yeah, just trying to get that pressure and stay on the map. But Scuttle Crab is going down for Dardock. So Dardock and Immortals will have the Scuttle Crab down. Gate, quite good at blocking those Dark Bindings with the Voidlings. Just spawns them so quickly. And like I was saying earlier, they actually pop and register before the health bar or the animation shows. So it looks like it, it, looks like it, it hits some, something else or nothing, and then it just pops up like, oh, it was there the whole time, I guess. It comes from the void. That makes perfect sense. You're right. You're right. It makes sense, because the void doesn't make sense. Flavor, the flavor Alliance. We've done it. Start going to take himself the red buff. Uh, Ocean Drake is up in a minute now, so Echo Fox can look to get a second one for themselves and keep the Drake snowball going that they had in game one. Looks like right now they're actually trying to work on that outer tower. Again, sticking together is the change I like it, even though the strategy looks very similar. Yeah. Oh, they went over the wall. Oh, it's a trap. They're actually they looking for an early Baron. But, but this is the thing. It's exactly, it's a trap. They have the Scuttle Crab on a mortal side. So this is actually them just saying, we're going to use the Blast Cone. People don't play around this just yet. Nobody really plays around this when they have that Scuttle Crab. They swept the pit. Acadian will get low, but they'll still pick it up. And then, oh, wait, what happened? That's Baron for Echo yep. Fox. And that's great. When we talked about their struggle to get Baron in game number one, they did the complete opposite. Instead of waiting until the very end of the game to try and take it, they'll take it pretty much at the earliest possible moment. And what Echo Fox do with this Baron pickup will be so important to watch. Looper eats the snare, then a binding, but pretty tanky, nice and safe with the Merc Threads helping him out. Acadian back down to the bottom lane to cover here as well. Drake's up also here if they want to get a Drake for themselves. So, Echo Fox, you have Baron buff. It's time to force something. Yeah. Top lane, though, they will lose this. Keep is, for some reason, up against the Fiora, which is a bad allocation of resources, to be quite honest. Uh, so, that's a free turret. Okay, now, though, locked up. Dardo going to knock him up as well, but Pogos are going to eat the ulti up from Gay. Arcadian gets it out, but shut down by Dardock. Just barely. Ole, though, taking damage from Lupa. Almost goes down as well. Dardock doesn't want to go through the storm. True shot barrage. Not going to hit. Nice little juke to the right there just to get out from under it. But Lupa trying to fight. He's forcing on the Dardock. That should be a kill. Froggen gets himself one around the Ocean Drake. Echo Fox still chasing. Wall doesn't quite get flame. Yep. The fact that they killed the jungler means no smite steal possible. Might be another one falling to Echo Fox here. 
And I gotta say, Echo Fox, they've had some bad luck with these drakes. And Keith? Oh, hey, surprise! Oh, well, Gates here as well, but Keith might die in it. That's Arcane Shift out of the way. Don't want to pull too many people off the drake, so they will get it. Flame, I like the attempt, but unsuccessful there. Yeah, he also got silenced, so couldn't use another Q there to get to the other side. So Gate, I mean, big props to him on this Malzahar. He's been doing quite a good job. People don't have those QSSs yet, so he can still make those plays. And Binding hits Acadian, and a really good reaction there from Froggix. It makes Olay have to go all the way around. He actually has to tormented soil on the Gate, whereas that would have killed Acadian much faster. Also gave them vision, which was kind of cute. You can see Echo Fox still confident in their team fighting, given that they're ahead. Yeah, and usually team fighting has been their problem. Right here, the skirmish is back and forth. Ends up going quite well for Echo Fox, getting them that Drake on top of it after getting the jungler, picking off Dardock. Really nice stuff here, but Baron Buff is starting to wear off these members, so I have to wonder just how much damage Echo Fox can do with that. That's one of the disadvantages of taking an early Baron usually so early that's difficult to do too much damage even though it is tricky to defend. Echo Fox I think decided to fight a few more. They wanted to get the third Drake which they did get but not getting too many turrets out of the deal would have really snowballed the gold lead for them. Keith will manage to get this one. They've got about a quarter of the buff left if they want to try and do a bit more damage but again sticking together covering Keith here in top lane and if Immortals come in for a fight Echo Fox feel confident they can win that. Now, Echo Fox seem to be playing those fights and not being afraid to take them just yet, but it's only a 2,000 gold vantage for themselves, or 1.5k, to be honest. Mm, Flame, I mean, he just keeps slow pushing. He's almost 40 CS up right now, uh, just slowly but surely trying to get advantages. He's the most CS in the game at the moment, and he's at that uh, 10 per minute mark. So Flame is just very methodical, seems to be like on a, on a pace, almost like a robot. Like, all right, let's just keep slow pushing, keep slow pushing. And he hasn't been missing out on fights either, though, so it's been... Quite good positioning from him and wave manipulation, to be and, honest. And we saw that from Immortals in game one. Uh, Flame was consistently a nuisance for Echo Fox splitting the lanes, but we saw Bobelta duck in the sidelines. Their general understanding of the macro game seems to be quite strong, and that's how they delayed the game for so long. I think Echo Fox are trying to counter that by just killing them and preventing them from being able to set up the pushes, but they, have, they can't be too reckless with it because if the waves are in a really bad spot, they're going to lose stuff. Yeah, and right here, though, now Fox have control of the mid and the bottom. Pobelter is up top. This guy doesn't have TP. He doesn't have a way to really get there. He has Rise Ultimate rank two, but how much damage will he get done to this turret in the time that they have to shove the bottom and the mid waves? Well, I think they're gonna try and dive Flame perhaps, and Flame knows it. Yeah, it's gonna back away. Looper does have coverage here, but Pobelter will finish off the turret. That's pretty good for a Rise, yeah. No reason to really stop pushing either. Everybody just plays safe. He has tempo on them. If they can slow this down, clear the mini wave out. Maokai. Luka went back, so Dardock's gonna get himself stunned. Ulti need as well. That's damage. Keith takes him out. Flame dives into the other side, trying to take out Gate, and will barely miss out on the kill. Flashes him for but Acadian gets away. Froggen stuns Ole and goes oh. in for the kills. The true shot for us picks him up on the back end. Looper went to add the top, and that's a triple for Keith. Yeah, they didn't even need Looper in there. That's a four on four. Pobelter not there. Large source of their damage. Dardock gets caught again trying to engage when he saw that Looper was out of there. And now Looper TP's down bottom. They're going to get an inhib off of this. Fox definitely solved a little bit of that issue, but it was handed to them by Dardock. What was Dardock thinking? Absolutely. As Fox are actually going to break the bottom inhib and maybe just go for the throat here. No Roll reason not to, but Belter's zoning him. That's going to be dead. Doesn't quite carry them to the Nexus and damages in. He'll flash out, but he barely escaped. Now Dardock back Keith. in, trying to make something happen. Keith is going to get flash on Boro, but Fox are going to fight their way out. Gate's not there, so it's 3v3 right now. It's Looper, very tanky, but he's getting melted slowly, but surely he'll get taken out. No, not quite as Dardock looks in. Bo Belter secures that final deal, and here comes Flame. Arcadia is invisible, beats himself out of the way. Bo Belter looking to chase down. Frog is going to get turned into an egg and taken down as well. Immortals save themselves the game. Yep, Flame looking for Acadian here. Has a relatively low cooldown. Will he chase? No, he's going to go for the mid lane wave. He's going to push this up because they need to get this middle turret down, get some pressure off of them, especially since they just lost that bottom inhibitor. Try to open up the map a little bit more. Binding didn't land. And then the follow-up chain was a little bit later there onto Acadian. And then Cody's son not able to actually get a kill there either. It has to wait that out. Really, really good. Really well played there from Echo Fox. And I was going to take a, one more look at that myself because I, it looked like Gate actually got a fantastic silence there, which interrupted Cody's son. But no, no, it didn't. But still, 
ended up playing that fight quite well. I mean, I like it from Echo Fox just going to the bottom lane, basically saying, hey, we're going to try and dive flame here. They did send Looper back, which was good. Even though Pobelta got a turret, they thought they could win an exchange there because he could TP back and then try and take something. And an inhibitor is a huge advantage at this stage of the game. And Echo Fox, it just feels like the pace has been picked up. Exactly, and it's the bottom inhibitor as well. And Baron up in 20 seconds, shove in the mid wave, get control of the top and the mid side of the map. The bottom will take care of itself, get more turrets off of this, and then they'll be able to actually claim the Baron as their own if they want to, or if they win a team fight right beforehand. It's just a confidence to Echo Fox that we didn't see until now. I said the game one win might help with momentum. It does feel like that could be coming true here. They're sticking together. Again, it's really simple League of Legends. But it's effective, and that's what Echo Fox need to do. They said, we don't fight enough as a team. All right, fine, we'll force it. Get together. We're only going to play this as a five-man. Yeah, it, they were overcomplicating things for a little bit, and then they were also trying to do things without, it, without risk. But there is always risk in what you try to do to try and end the game. So when they were trying to make those picks, I mean, it was kind of like they were waiting in game one for somebody to make a mistake. There's a mistake from Pete. Oh, certainly is. Dardo with the first kill there. Now 5v4. Gay getting chased in. Flame repost and Sun Looper, but he's getting off the down. Looper gonna try and lock out the front of the team fight, but Acadian has to book it. Froggen can't quite do enough damage. Crit's there on the other side. Oh, hey. Who's gonna take him out? Froggen, he's really large. Can hear Looper find the fight. Gay can't quite do it. Froggen goes down. And Looper, now 1v4, will be crushed as well. He lives for a while, but that's a team fight winner model. Woo, and they are so low on top top of this, if Baron's going to do a decent amount of damage here. Is Gate going to stay? No, he's not. So Immortals... Is he back? There we go. Okay, finally backs up. So that's going to be Baron for Immortals. Flame doesn't want to die. Yep. Make sure that's he peels off the Baron. They there have is to struggle right creatively. There. <laughs> There's honey fruit right there, guys. It's like, they really want to keep doing damage. You get the honey fruit and pick it up. But... Zardok early smited as well, just for the health, knowing Arcadian was still dead. And this was just key. Hitting a snare that he didn't need to. Yeah, Cody Sun hitting Keith, who walked in front of everybody to try and get a Q there. And the pick and ban where they tried to force him onto something where you feel a little bit more confident on Ezreal being forward because you can E backwards as opposed to like a Jin where you always play back. So now Keith, this position, gets caught out. And Ole, great follow up here, puts himself at risk by going in, gets another follow up finding onto Froggen. Pole Belter does go down there, though, but they do get enough damage on top of it. And right now, it's a looks like it might be a smite fight in a second here, but they're waiting for more members. They actually, Echo Fox don't know how many members of Immortal are there. And again, Dardoff, we talk about his aggressive tendencies. Well, that was a very strong head of play, but works out this time with Echo Fox not having any additional knowledge. Might try and get a pick off here, actually. And they found Dardock, that's good. These spells just not enough by the looks of things. And Looper follows him over the wall. There's a true shot right, Tim, but Dardock is very tanky. Yep, got the Black Shield a little bit later, but it did help him out a lot to get out and escape. So now, just reset a little bit. Immortals, once again, 2k gold advantage. Again, Echo Fox, again, it happened again. Somebody gets picked, somebody gets rooted, the positioning of their front line or their back line is incorrect, and Echo Fox lose the team fight, and now the kills are even, <laughs> they are in, oh, they're in a deficit again. I mean, that Baron, I'm going crazy, pastry. I'm going right. crazy. That Baron buff does turn the game for Immortals. So when Echo Fox looking for a pick, Dardock again is the target. But have Malthar ultimate, they'll still come in for a counter. The Colossus works. Cody Sun not quite there with the ultimate, but they do throw them away. Dardock committed the flash to get away, but that's twice now they've tried and failed. Yep, and now Flame going to continue to put pressure on this bottom side. He's pushing against Super Minions, and the inhibitor just respawns, so there are no more left in this wave. And he has the Baron buff up, so this is where Flame really shines. Frogan caught again. No end. It's okay. Seraph's still gonna help him. Keith actually finally gets done on Echo Fox. Get the prize they wanted. Flame is there with teleport. He has to back away. Yeah, but they know that nobody Ooh, no, is backed off. Nobody's backed off. They see all five of them there. They like Looper's still here. Go for the gold. Start going for it. Race on perhaps here is Echo Fox trying to push against the Baron up minions. They want the turret. They are gonna turn their attention to a flame. Gonna come here for that inhibitor. Middle broken though. This could be dangerous for Immortals. Yeah, depending on how Flame positions himself. He could try to end the game right now. He does have a decent amount of minions and a cannon minion wave. They're going to go for the bottom inhibitor. Dardoch. He's going to try to end the game. Dardoch's dead for so long. I don't know if they want to do this. This bottom inhib, who's going to go over? Flame is just slapping away at that turret. Echo Fox knows they have to leave. They have to stop the back. They have to stop Looper's back. Oh, Looper made it back. Gate made it back too, I think. No, there is Looper. Excuse me, you are correct. And that's Flame forced away. Great trade for Echo Fox. Yeah, Looper, good job hiding himself right outside of vision. If he gets stopped there, they have to keep running this entire route, and then maybe that's enough time for Flame to actually take another turret. He didn't have another minion wave coming up. We got 
cleared out quite quickly. Oh, go away, no! You don't want to stand there, but Dialog actually caught as well. Ulti didn't bite him out, and if he is through, oh, they're going to go down to Keith? No, not quite, as Flame takes him out instead. Dialog, Frog in. Fast forward, but Frog is going to get turned into an egg. Echo Fox needs to go back into the team fight. Looper taking where he can. Froggen makes it back alive. No, not quite, as Poe Butler does take him down. Arcadian, he knows he has to leave. He leaves the tree to die. He'll revive, but Immortal's going to 3v1 him and take him down. And this game is crazy. And now they see Acadian on the bottom side that he ran straight through. They have a gigantic mini wave on the top side. Flame is going to TP to the top side. It's going to be him versus Acadian for 20 seconds, but he's at least going to get a turret, possibly an inhibitor on top. He can't 1v1 the Fiora, surely. Acadian made so much happen for this team already. I mean, Flame is level 18. He's the only level 18 in the game right now. He is so much further ahead than everybody at the moment. He's been farming incredibly well, highest in the game, just by a little bit over Poe Belter. That's going to be another inhibitor. Both inhibitors were taken by Flame and solo missions. He's doing work. Great timing from Flame as well, because Keith and Gate respawned at exactly the same time. Had about two seconds to get out once the inhibitor fell down, but great presence of mind from a player that has always been good in a side lane. And that's the knowledge of a split pushing top laner, where he looks at the death timer, says, it will take me 20 seconds to take both of these and get out and be safe. A lot of people will TP, be like, I don't know if that's enough time, and then they'll try to do the inhibitor, and then all of a sudden, these guys are running out with home guard towards you, and you overestimated the amount, or underestimated the amount of time. Well, all of a sudden, we have a real interesting game once again. So you have two different super minion waves fighting each other. Bottom lane will maybe cancel each other out, but it's top lane down for Echo Fox and mid lane still down for Immortals. Their inhibs will respawn sooner, but now Elder Dragon is on the table and up in a minute 55. Baron will spawn in a number of minutes as well. There's some big moments coming up in this game, and both teams are looking very hungry and very aggressive, which is a whole lot of fun. Yep, and now this mid lane finally gonna get knocked down here, and Immortals will take that last tier one that's been mocking them. But it's the only lane that has an inhibitor up, and they get to push it down. Even on turrets as a result as well. Looper, he's spent a lot of time trying to kill this super minion. Does have the teleport if he needs to join the team, so things are okay for now, but Flame lies in wait. Looks like the lucky customer may be Looper, but Looper knows a little bit better than that by the looks of things. Yep. Ward's on the side as well to make sure that they don't get flanked around. Flame is going to help escort this minion wave in. And when you escort a minion wave in on the side, it helps you open up options for yourself. Does he want to fight the tank? Does Dardoch come and help him and assist him? Or does he continue and push it all the way into the base? And then that gives him a flank angle. And then as soon as one or two people pull off of the main, they just push four down in the mid lane. They get that tier two turret. So actually pushing up the side wave when the inhibitor is down as a, as a top laner can be very beneficial because it gets him a better angle on the fights and it pushes their tank, the Maokai, further into the base. And I just caught a glimpse of Flame's player cam. He is so vocal on comp right now. Oh. Really knowing that this is the game he wants to play. Frog gets chunked. He's though. the wave clear. So now the wave clear is gone. The super minions were pouring in as well from the opposite side. So now they get a little bit more time. And Froggen has to go clear these out. He's going to clear that top wave of supers. Little mortals still moving further forward, slow and steady. Seems to be the method right now, but things will break open so quickly. This game will end if just one team puts a foot out of line. Oh, yeah. And that's what, the, that's what the problem is, is you have to actually get a good angle on your opponent and make sure that you put him in a bad position. That's what Flame is trying to do. Flame keeps pushing, escorting these minion waves in. And now Acadian and people start pushing to this side, playing to this side, and now Looper has to go top, so you start spreading them thin. But now there's objectives. Yep. And now Immortals kind of have to think, this is a big decision to make. You have literally two sides of the map and the center all important to you. Where do you go? Immortals, the question, the answer, sorry, seems to be Baron, at least right now. But I go folks, they can't afford to give him the Elder Dragon, not with three drakes. Yep. Can't even see them. Flame doesn't have TP, so he actually has to pull off. Goes to the blue buff, pick that up. They have complete vision of this. Flame, okay, so this is where it gets tricky. You have to 4v4 here, Looper has teleport. And this will actually get picked up Too so late. quick. Yeah, that damage is insane from Immortals as they just duck off with pretty much the perfect amount of time ready to take the objective down. And now Echo know that we're still waiting for Inhibs to respawn. I mean, mids respawn for Immortals, bots now respawn for Echo Fox, but there's still trouble to do, and Immortals is going to take this objective off the map. Yeah, the Elder Dragon now on the map. They see everybody inside the base, so Olay feels comfortable to actually back, pick up Boots. Sorry, pick up the Phoenix Codex. Had the mobility boots the whole time. They were just actually moved. My eye was like, hey, look at that. But still. 
And our Immortals have everything they need to try and end this game. They're almost 10,000 gold ahead. Echo Fox getting creative, seeing if someone sticks their nose a little too far forward. It could be Dardock again. It's been very headstrong this game. And they're going to try catch him out, not move, not trigger the Tremor Sense. Clever play. Try and play on the Rek'Sai like that, but now Immortals in the driver's seat. We're talking about gold advantages. Now it's up to about 8,000, 9,000. It's getting a little bit out of hand now. And Immortals are just, they have Baron, they have Elder. Yep, it's everything. Immortals should be able to end the game from this point if they can just win one last little exchange. Flame is still guiding those minions in towards it with the Baron buff. Echo Fox is just running out of options. They have no good ones left, that's for sure. And Immortals are going to do what they kind of always have as a team is, you know, play it safe, play at a pretty breakneck speed for the team. Maybe it's a little different now that the team's changed, but they've always been good at closing games. You have to think Cobalt is there, making sure the team is ending the game correctly. Yep. Very hard to end the game against the Nivea, though. They have to make a play. They have to put themselves out there. Oh, doesn't Frogger know that? <laughs> as he manages to wave clear that out. Flame going to get chased away. He's kind of trying to keep the little Baron Cannon going for it. Keith and Frogger again joining in, making sure the top end hip stays down. In fact, Immortals back off. Elder Dragon does last a little bit longer now, I believe, so we'll have a bit more time with their buffs to play with, but couldn't find an angle they liked by the looks of things, so we're looking at a very brief reset. Slow and steady is the name of the game now for Immortals. They clawed their way back into the game, and now approaching six items for the most of them here. Oh, we're pretty much where we were last game, except Immortals have a little more in terms of tools to help them close it out. They have the CC to try and make picks, if you miss position, like you were saying, one step, one foot out of line, top by Morgana binding, that could be it right there. Looks like Pobelt is actually doing a top lane split push as well. 1-3-1, one, one, trying to do what Echo Fox did to them. Not with the Rise ulti ready to go. Looper though answering that. Ooh, ulti misses, but I like the attempt from Cody Sun. No reason not to poke them down, really. You can see the Varus poke actually doing a pretty significant chunk. Flame able to take the inhib once again. Dardock making sure sure. He stays safe, and there's Poibelta with the top lane. Yep, that's how you do the 1-3-1. People pull off and push forward, if, especially if you're better in a 1v1. Like, how is the Ezreal supposed to deal with the Fiora? And you would want to put the Anivia on the side wave, the wave clear, but you need her in the mid because you don't have a wave clear champion otherwise. Oh, Poibelta, 1v1! He's just delaying the inevitable right now. It off, can get oh, there. he flashes. And now the rest of the team is chasing him. He's trying to ulti up. Oh, oh, oh he gets eaten up by Kane. That's going to be a kill of all. Also, Lurching Floor trying to end the game. Flame is low. Dardock's on turret. He's going to try to get this turret. He's trying to open up the Nexus. He wants it. It's now open. Immortals. Can they get in? Arcadian dives in onto Cody Sun. Goes in Viz. Going to look for the big play. Looper straight in onto the back line. That's Frog got hit. Sun. Dead Frog. And dead though from Flame, but turned into an egg. Crucially survives that moment. And Flame, don't think about it. It's not worth your life here. Echo Fox somehow defend a wide open Nexus. Yeah, just place some wards around it, you know, maybe TP into it later. But there's there's a control ward pinged out. It's yep. Like, better, better clear that ward, boys. That could be an issue. Okay, it's off to do it. He's like, yes, I know my job. Make sure that we don't get back to it. Yep, there's one more ward, though, that's off on the left, right underneath gate. I mean, the minions can get in there as well, so they have to be careful because the wave will push through. Yeah, they, he doesn't know who's back. To, if he goes over that wall, as soon as... Yeah, they, no, they see him, actually. But, yeah. A little indecisive there from Flame, but I think he's using his better judgment and, yep, just going to take a couple of jungle camps instead. So the game will not end just yet. <laughs> but there are no major buffs right now. Immortals, you have to think, they're just going to charge in. They've got nothing left to take but the Nexus and the mid inhibitor and the bottom inhibitor, I guess, which is no, not respawn. Yeah, that's a control ward, excuse me. This could get very interesting in this last fight because we've seen Ryze's ulti in Europe. That was a really good from Frog to actually predict where Pobelter was going to go. He ran upward right into the queue and then boom, flash ulti right as it was about to go off. Pobelter goes down. Flame also engaged at the same time. And instead, Dardock's like, the turret. The turret is what matters here. He's absolutely right. Getting that turret down is crucial, because now they could make a rise play onto that Nexus. They could use the ultimate and get the Realm Warp onto it with five members if they wanted to. We'll see how Immortals play the last minutes of this game. It doesn't seem like it'll last for too much longer, but we had a pretty long game in game number one. We're 42 minutes into this one already, just six away from tying 
the game time in our first one. It's been a real back and forth exchange between these two teams, but Immortals they just want to force another game here. It's the last inhibitor in front of them. Echo Fox, though, they want to end it. They want to just have this be, be done with and over with and try to 2 0 Immortals. The gold, sure, it's an advantage right now for Immortals, but there's really half an item left to come in for some members like the Kha'Zix. Oh, Keith. I thought he was going to walk back into that binding. This is such a hard position to play from on Fox's side. Flame with GA. How do you deal with him if you walk and try to put too many Ooh, members on him? Cody Sun's ult hit Gates passive. That's not a good look, but Akkadian not going to eat the binding. Leaps away, but Gate eats it instead. Now Pobelt's going to get the first kill. Flame just wants the Nexus. No, he's going to go for Akkadian. Shuts him down. Immortal get a surge forward. Ravage through Echo Fox and look to end the game. The next is open. They are just gonna take what they can. Lupa is tanking his best again, but Flames get away in the game. Immortals, two fourths a third. Echo Fox again with first blood and an advantage, but Immortals hold on. They use their CC and they tie up the series. It was that pivotal Baron take. Even though Echo Fox essentially cheats the first Baron with a really clever Early Baron there between Anivia and Kha'Zix, but was not enough Immortals. The regression kind of cost them in the early game as they fell behind, but it certainly rewarded them towards the end of the game. And all they had to do by the end was just kind of guide the minions in. They took their mid-game advantage that they got and rode it all the way to Echo Fox's Nexus. This is becoming a meme at this point where it's Echo Fox late game. Like, they just don't seem to know how to end it. They'll have Baron buffs, they'll have inhibitors down. What are the steps to end the game? And it ends up being, well, Looper starts dying or Flame starts getting so far ahead that it's so hard to contest it or they don't make the same picks anymore. Or they don't do the tower flanks that they were doing previously and they just let people actually scale back up. And it just becomes honestly a big disaster for Echo Fox because their early game looks really good. It looks really clean. Akkadian is getting them off the ground. They're getting those first three outer turrets. And then it's from there, it's just completely downhill. And it seems like they just don't know what to do or how to communicate with each other to actually close the game out. Well, it's been a fun series. And that was another chaotic game. But for more on this series time game, we are going to toss it over to the analysts. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yes, this seems to be a bit of a holdover issue for Echo Fox from last season in their inability to close out games in which they have secured advantages. Immortals tying it up here, moving us to a third game. Yeah, I mean, when you saw the additions to this roster, I think we can all agree Acadian in the early game is working out much better than I think what a lot of people are expecting, myself included. Mm -hmm. um, but the big concern not only was, you know, the, the players that they're getting was who's actually going to end up leading this team because you don't imagine that, you know, Gate's going to become a huge one, uh, shot caller, even though he is, he's a good, like, uh, glue guy in, yeah. in a sense in terms of spirit and and always having a positive attitude and talking about, hey guys, we can still win this. That's not the same as saying, this is what we do to win this. Right. And, and they don't seem to have that based off this game. And that was the problem last year as well. No, I mean, your loudest personality is your rookie in Acadian, right? And he's going to take some time to be able to adjust and maybe grow into a shot calling role. Whereas your veterans like Froggen, I mean, we heard in a replay yesterday, radio silence from him in a winning team fight. So there are still definitely questions to be answered around Echo Fox's ability to close a game once they have advantages. But let's go ahead and talk about the early game that was put together here for Echo Fox and then kind of work through where some of those advantages could have been taken had they played properly. As you mentioned, Acadian has been on fire for yes. Echo Fox in early pressure and securing first bloods. I mean, we saw him go top, initially get the first kill onto Flame, start setting up the top side of the map to be a, a winning setup. The problem is on the flip side, things aren't going great on the bottom, right. but then it's still not going that bad because Frog was able to get that weird chase down cleanup kill that happened, and, and things seem to be going well for uh, Echo Fox when you just look at you know the scoreboard at the top of the screen. But as you start looking at the, the gold, it never started growing despite there being so many kills going in their favor. And like the CS leads were never there and, and they started getting turrets. And even then the lead wasn't growing as quick. They get a Baron, still no gold lead really, like a two grand at most. It, right. It's confusing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they had they were up in kills, up in turret takes, had a Baron under their belt at very early. It was a very cheeky, very awesome. Yes, it was smart. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Baron sneak by the two of them. And so we've got to give them credit where credit is due. But here's the thing. If you're going to do something like that, if you're going to invest the resources in picking up that early Baron, you have to use it to actually they attain more advantages. One, I think they one got turret? one turret, the yeah, top lane like turret. Outer, and, and if you're not using that to put more pressure on in the map, then you're in trouble because across the map is a Fiora. 
And eventually that Fiora is going to get to a point where she can split push down your inhibs against a Maokai. And, and, and it's not Maokai's fault for not winning those 1v1s. Of course, before we get to that split pushing and those inhibs, we've got to take a look at the game-changing fight that was put together by Immortals. And all of this comes off of the Varus ultimate here. So as Zyrene had mentioned at the outro of that game, great use of CC by this squad to secure the advantages here and ultimately break the game back open. Yeah, I mean, I had Keith on the D tier and looking to move down. He's doing his damnedest to do that because he gets caught out the start of this fight, blown up, and it's a 4v5 the rest of the way through and credit to, to Echo Fox, they actually don't play the rest of this fight that bad. Looper's doing a good job frontlining. Froggen's able to keep getting damage down. And if you look at the front line of Immortals, they actually start getting very low over the course of this fight. And it's the kind of thing where if you had an Ezreal alive, throwing some Qs at these tanks, they probably go down and you can actually win this fight despite the fact that the setup for it was, was pretty terrible. Yeah, that's what you're mentioning right there. That's about 500 to 1,000 health left on both of the frontliners there for Immortals with some Ezreal damage to support all of that. You may actually see that fight still go into Echo Fox's favor. And then they have the kind of advantage that they can close the game out with. But Not Immortals did come out with the victory. And for a roster that, you know, uh, was essentially dismantled and rebuilt around Poe Belter and bringing in people, for example, like Dardock, who we've had some questions around mentality, especially in games that are not going super well for him. They were able to mount a pretty solid defense here and ultimately claw their way back into it. By the end, you can see they had total control of the game in terms of goal. Right, and I think if there's a team that deserves a little bit of leniency in the league, I mean, there's a couple, but I think Immortals is a really big one. They've had probably the biggest turnover out of anybody with just Poe Belter coming back. Most of these guys have not played much together on top of the fact that a lot of them are just new in general. Cody Sun is a rookie. Ole is new to NA. Flame is new to NA. Dardock just joined the team, and Poe Belter is supposed to be this rock, but it's it's so hard to see exactly how this team's going to function when they're so new. And, and I, I think it's a little uh, unfair to look at them in the same light as we're looking at some of the other teams who have a bunch of pieces who all have kind of existed at least in the same ecosystem before, whereas most of these guys have never existed even against each other on the Rift. Right, absolutely. And then, of course, if we look forward to Game 3 here and try and figure out maybe what some of these, or rather either of these teams should do to scrape together a victory, I've got to look at this pick ban phase and, and take note here from Echo Fox that they opted to take take Anivia as that in that second rotation of phase one, knowing that if they took their mid laner, they're going to get banned, double banned in ADC, as opposed to if they take an ADC, they'll get double banned in mid. But the mid pool is much greater. So right. for some reason, they're favoring this Anivia far more than they're favoring what would have been an Ash or a Jin pick instead. Right. And so I think you know, kind of putting themselves in the position where they were, they were going to get uh, pinch banned in the second rotation somehow, either AD carry or mid. Going for the mid pick is a little confusing, uh, and then they're forced onto the Ezreal. So I like what Immortals was doing and able to force that situation, but then it seemed weird that they went with the Morgana themselves, yeah. as opposed to uh, maybe a more stable uh, position or champion for the support position in like a Karma or something. And, and overall, despite setting themselves up well in the draft, I don't think Immortals was able to exploit it as hard as they needed to. Mm -hmm. um, and Echo Fox, I mean, you can look at the draft all you want, but at the end of the day, that comes down to the play and, and the reason that they weren't able to close it out and Keith getting killed over and over in the bot lane, those kinds of things. You're playing Ezreal. Right. You're not going to suddenly not be dying because you're on Ash or something. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, and it is a tough spot because already right off the bat, when you saw that rise locked in first rotation, you're aware of the fact, cool, that's most likely going mid. Very rarely right. it would go to the top lane. But opting into the power picks of Maokai and Malzahar, showing that support is what allowed Immortals the opportunity to force the pinch here yep. in that second rotation. So as you mentioned, it is a tough spot for Echo Fox to navigate. And part of the learning curve of having this 10 band system is oh, okay all right now we understand how maybe we we need to mirror match in that first phase so that we have more options in the second phase or we're taking we're very clearly taking a deficit or a disadvantage in a lane we're gonna have to cover for it elsewhere i mean Ezreal is one of the safer ADCs, so I, that you're right in saying that it doesn't change the fact that Keith got caught there in that fight that really did turn the game. You're right, and I think it's the kind of thing where I, I do like Echo Fox kind of pinching the support pool a little bit, uh, and it did kind of force that Morgana pick, but there seemed like there are other options available. So I think both teams have a little bit of cleaning up to do in the draft, but the bigger problem is what's going on in-game for both of them. Alrighty, well, closing out on game two, player of the game is going to go to Flame. We already mentioned this. I mean, he's playing Fiora. You let Fiora get to five items, and they're most likely going to get player of the game anyway just because of how many objectives they're I able mean, to take. I mean, you take a couple in, uh, <laughs> inhib turrets and inhibs by yourself, you're getting a player of the game most likely. Right. I mean, from everyone
everyone across the board score lines aren't necessarily jumping out at us and going, oh, he's 100% kill participation. No, but ultimately sticking to his job description in keeping those side lanes pushed and being a threat for the team is what allowed them to take a victory. We're going to take a quick break, but join us back here for our conclusion to the series between Echo Fox and Immortals. We'll see you soon. I did not scream let's go, actually. Actually, you did. Wait, really? Yeah. Hey, man, there's nothing wrong with getting hyped up. You know, you <clears> fucking <throat> ace them, you can shit talk them. Yeah. I'm down with that. That's good shit. I think he knows that something's up. He's got a cat. Can he get himself out of the way? Acadian, can he make a pull before he lands? Oh! It? Does it again? He got him as he flashed, too. He predicted the flash. He's just everywhere. Red Frogger wants it. He wants a lay. Stuns him up. Damage is there. Acadian again. 2 0. Okay, Maokai. Hey, to me. Maokai, Maokai, Maokai. We're going to TP behind. Anivia. Give it to a carry. How do you see her? Okay, nice. nice. Oh, go away, no! You don't want to stand there, but Dardock actually caught as well. Both he did by the mouth, and if he is through, are oh, they going to go down to Keith? No, not quite, as Flank takes him out instead. Dardock, Frog in! Fast forward, but Frog is getting it turned into an egg. Echo Fox needs to go back into the team fight. Lamb just wants the Nexus. No, he's going to go for Arcadian. Shuts him down. Immortals get a search forward. Rabbits through Echo Fox and look to end the game. The next is open. The Hunt's gonna take what they can. Lupus is tanking his best again, but Flames get away the game. Immortals, two fourths a third.